The Old Testament reading is from Exodus chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they, then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt both man and beast, and all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is, what many of you, this is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. We rise. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you will have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. 
For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table close to Jesus. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then, after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out. And it Dear friends in Christ, the text for this evening's sermon is from John 13 about Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. As you all know, the details in John's gospel makes it a very interesting read. He famously leaves out the words of the Lord's institution of the Lord's Supper, but he includes the traces of Jesus' new covenant in the washing of his disciples' feet. The towel and the basin filled with water don't replace the body and the blood. It just comes a little before that for a special reason. Like how you would wash your hands before eating a meal, washing one's feet before a meal was customary in Jesus' day. It was a way in which you prepared your mind for a meal. When you come into your guest's home, there would be a bowl filled with water and a towel for you to freshen up. Or if your host was pretty well off, he would have a servant wash your feet for you when you came in. The very first interesting piece of detail in John's gospel is how he makes note of the timing of when Jesus washes his disciples' feet. It wasn't before dinner or after dinner. It was during supper when the devil had already put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing Judas would betray him, rises from the table. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist, poured water into the basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. The disciples came to the table and they sat down. No one volunteered to wash each other's feet. They were covered with dirt at the bottom of their souls. And this uncovered something about them, about their soul. And seeing this, Jesus did what was remarkable and unthinkable at that time. He pours out the water. He washes, wipes, laid aside his outer garment, and knelt at the feet of each one of his disciples and washes them clean. He goes to Nathaniel, the one who asked, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He needed just a little more convincing that Jesus is truly who he said he is. Jesus washes the feet of the skeptic. He goes to Thomas, who after Jesus' death says, unless I see his hands in the mark of nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Jesus washes clean the souls of the one who doubted in him in his bodily resurrection. And then there's James and John, who asked, Grant us to sit one at your right and one at your left in your glory. Jesus washes the souls 
of those who sought after their own glory and were in it for the wrong reasons. Jesus makes his way to each one of the other disciples who had argued amongst themselves who was the greatest, but yet cowered in fear when Jesus was arrested. And then there's Judas, the one who was entrusted the money bags of the disciples, the word of good news about our Lord and Savior, and and the one whom our Lord authorized to do these signs and wonders in his name. Instead, he would stoop lower than Jesus. He would put a price on his master's head. Christ washes the feet of a betrayer, knowing already what he's going to do. And finally, Peter, the rock, the one who was quick to speak and act, and who would deny Jesus three times before the crow even ro- and before the rooster even crows. Jesus washes the souls of a denier. Do you see yourself in one of these disciples? I know I do. Not just one, multiple ones. Depends on the day. These are the types of people for whom Jesus washes clean, whom he would lay down his life for before his table. Foot washing is a dirty job. It's beneath us. Nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants to have to stoop down. We would pass it along to the next person if we could. Just like loving our enemies, praying for them, and forgiving those who wronged us in the past. Maybe there's a sense of unworthiness too, somewhere in there. The shame from the callousness, the hurt, and the pain we've accumulated over the years that keeps us from coming to church. Whatever it may be, Jesus gently corrects Peter. If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And that is more the reason why we should be washed by Jesus and be encouraged by Peter's change of heart and repentance. Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head too. In washing us, Jesus prepares us for his supper. The third interesting detail about Mark's go- John's gospel is the recollection of the verbs that he chooses. John notes that Jesus laid down his outer garments and then he takes them back up again. This is because foot washing will point to everything that Jesus will do for you when he pours out his blood and washes you clean of all your sins. He will wipe the slate clean of sin, lay down his outer garments, and kneels before you and washes each one of you clean. And then Jesus will rise on Easter Sunday. You have been baptized into Jesus' name and to this hope of Jesus' death and resurrection. In your baptism, Jesus picked up the towel in the basin and came over to you. He reached down to the dirtiest of places and washes each part of you clean, your hands, your head, your entire body, the soles of your feet, your soul too. And that's why having been washed clean by the blood of Christ, your feet are clean to love and serve one another. You are ready for supper. So come, take, eat, drink, all of you. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen.